Welcome into the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Welcome to the Pelicans podcast presented by Seat Geek. Uh, that was that was the national anthem the night uh, that the Pelicans played the Knicks, and I thought to myself, surely can't get any worse than that. That was as good as it got, and I am joined by the highly perturbed Jim Eichenhofer. Uh, Jim, uh, today, you know, we could have started off with just metal music across the board. Mm. Just a Jim rant, mm. uh, a Joe rant, uh, the, the janitor rant, <laughs> the security guard rant. Everybody's been ranting at me like I am yep. making the decisions for the Pelicans because mm-hmm. I, I wear the little logo on the shirt. Maybe uh, maybe I should put sunglasses on the Pelican or something uh, until they, they fix things here. But, but I don't have any answers, man. And, and the thing is, what's frustrating for me is... The lack of effort. It just seems like if, if you ever had a must win, to me, that Knicks game was it. To me, that was the pivot point of whether or not I'm going to start worrying. And, and and I've been banging the drum almost to the point where I feel foolish uh, to where like, hey, we can turn it around now. We can turn it around now. Well, now's the time to turn around. Then was the time to turn it around. And it just looked like a deeply unserious basketball team. Yeah, the way that they started that game was really perplexing. Um, Like you said, I guess I'm perturbed today, not ebullient or effervescent. Yes, yes. The the way you've described me before in some of the other shows. But, yeah, I mean, I've heard the rants from from everyone. Um, Don't have a lot of answers right now. Unfortunately, not to pile on the, the sadness a little bit, but Larry Nance Jr. got hurt in that game. And is listed as out. Oh yeah, against Orlando. Thanks, Jim. So we're gonna see. Um, sounds like the starting lineup is gonna remain the same from what they've tried the last couple games, but um, obviously there's gonna be some a replacement for Larry Nance. So we're gonna see some combination of of Jackson Hayes and Billy Hernan Gomez. Maybe they can provide a spark. Uh, there were some other guys that played well at the end of the Knicks game after it was drastically out of reach and way out of 30 hand. plus points. I thought Kyra Lewis had some good minutes as well, but beyond that, it, there really wasn't a lot of good things that you could possibly say about. And I'm, I'm game. with the people that were like, Hey, what, why is it taking so long to get Dyson? Who's available and Kyra in there? I understand that Dyson's been out for a while. Mm-hmm. You don't want to rush him back, give him a ton of minutes, but at a certain point, it's like, send a message, sit some butts down on the bench uh, it was just ridiculous watching the New York Knicks act like the Harlem Globetrotters and the Pelicans are just standing around confounded like the Washington Generals uh, as they are just doing dunk contest dunks. Uh, I cannot think of a more demoralizing game, uh, a more demoralizing situation. And I, to me, the high point of the game, other than the anthem, which I was obsessed with, uh, was uh, Brandon Ingram getting that tech. When, when Brandon Ingram got mad and actually threw the ball off the stanchion, I was like, about time. Good. Uh, because we're going to talk about it with our guest today, Mr. David Wesley of Bally Sports. But, you know, it's been great watching the camaraderie on the team, watching the friendships. But a part of friendship is being able to go, hey, man, what's up with you? Yeah. Uh, every now and then. <laughs> and, and you hope that the Pelicans are close enough to be able to call each other out in that way. But if not, it's time to learn how to hurt some feelings and still remain friends. Uh, because the effort out there, the defensive effort, uh, the lack of effort on transition, it's just, it's glaring. It just seems like a team that's that's given up, and this is not the time to lay down. Yeah, Brandon Ingram was throwing a basketball off the stanchion. We were throwing things in the radio studio. Yep. Not at each other. We're not there no, no. yet. Yes, but... Jim was in the radio studio, by the way. We should mention fireworks uh, went off after he left because Literally, the city celebrates yes. him. And Jim yes. thought they were gunshots, so we had to cover them <laughs> like we were the Secret Service. Uh, but it was it was a weird broadcast, man. I think, you know, me, you, and Gus were in the studio ready for the turnaround. Uh, because, yeah. you know, we I, to me, I was just like, this is, this is the team – where we get right. This is the game where we get right. There are no excuses anymore. They understand the, the urgency of the moment. And that turned into just a three man funeral. I hate to bring up old wounds too, but I actually went in with the game plan of the last time I had gone into the radio studio and they played the Knicks on the road. It was the disastrous execution of the last 
a uh, few seconds where they gave up an open three. People remember that. Yeah. I don't need to go back over that. So I'm thinking, yeah. okay, I'm going to bring in new di- new vibes. Yes. It's going to be different this time. The game at MSG, this one's going to be a win. Yeah, Jim they're was wearing start a out, bracelet. It was amazing. They're going to start out amazing, and then they're down 10 points in the first yeah. four or five minutes. So that didn't work at all. No. So I guess I'll have to try again sometime. Yeah, you got, you got to bring some different juju, man. Yeah. Get a different bracelet, switch it out. I hate... When uh, Todd Graffinini is correct, and I agree with him. I love Todd Graffinini, but let's not say he's the most joyful, hopeful person yes. sometimes when yes. things are down are going uh, poorly early. And the thing is, when he was calling daggers in the second, a lot of times I would goof on Graff for that. He was 100% correct. You could just see it in the team. You don't want to see a bunch of young guys who are this close to really making a run just sort of get lazy down the stretch, especially when you came into the season with such swagger. That's what makes this hurt more to me than last season. When it, when everything was going poorly sure. and then turned around, whatever, that was house money. That was great. You came into this season with an expectation. You are going to ride that momentum. You saw them for media day. They came into the season with swagger. They were mm-hmm. feeling themselves. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to say, hey, were you feeling yourselves too much? You you want them to be correct. And to me, the team as constructed should be correct. It is confounding to watch them struggle like this as constructed. I understand you could say Jonas is tired. CJ is a little banged up. But, man, you, you, you hate to see the same problems consistently. When the entire game is based on the mid-range, score in the paint. Yeah. I know you want more threes, but, you know, you can wish for a lot of things. They're not falling. you got to find another way to score. And I think one of the most pressing things that speaks to the urgency of there's only 20-ish games left in the season and something that David Wesley also gets into in the conversation with him is it's not just that you lo- you're you losing games. It's that the lack of competitiveness, the slow starts that I've um, harped on multiple times already, um, just – you're going to lose games. You're going to lose games on the road, but you can't be losing by 30 you can't and just being humiliated. routed you can't get constantly. Danced. Right. I mean, right. in a game that you need that much, you can lose. Fine. You you have a hard fought loss. I can respect that. But you got absolutely demolished. Todd Graffinini called before the game. He's like, you know, if it's really bad is if you start here and if you see Derek Rose come out, it's absolutely awful. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, you started hearing chants, and Graf on the broadcast thought it was Jericho. That's what they said on TV as well. Joel said that, boy, they really like Jericho. Yeah, he was I like, thought that was what it was as well because Derek Rose is so far out of sight, out of mind that it didn't even totally occur to me. Totally forgot he was in the league for right, a minute. Right. Uh, and then, sure enough, it was Derek Rose and Todd Graffinini, an oracle in his own right, a dark oracle, if you will. Uh, it came to fruition. Derek Rose is out there just jacking up shots hoping to score before the game ends that was the state of the pelicans and if that doesn't piss them off i don't know what will uh so you got to go out against the magic tonight who are you're at home and the magic have absolutely smacked us in the mouth before if this game isn't a get right game if you don't come out with pride on this one I don't know. Maybe maybe you should give up on the season. I I don't think if you if you come out flat on this one, this is not a playoff team at all. Man, Joe, you are going off. This is a this is a Joe rant, epic proportions. But I will say, you are not calling them out. You're calling them I'm up. Calling them up is what right. I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm just calling them up. Guess what? We got Mr. David Wesley joining us. J- Jim and I, we're not athletes. Uh, you know, we haven't been dunking on people, so it's hard. How do we know what to do? But you know who does? David Wesley. He played in the league for what, 12, 13 years, 20 years, 30 years? Who knows? He's ageless. Uh, But he played in the league. He knows what's what. He is a former athlete, and we need his perspective now more than ever. So let's get with Bally Sports' own Mr. David Wesley. Joining us on the Pelicans podcast, it's been a while and we have missed him and I I can't think of a time when we have needed his perspective more. Bally Sports color analyst, Mr. David Wesley, Sir David Wesley, if you will. How are you, man? How are you feeling today? Good good morning to y'all and I'm doing great Uh, out here in Dallas and it's uh, decent weather today, so I'll take it. Yeah, it's good weather here as well, David. I think that's one good thing that was to start the day that we I'll look, take whatever. look at. Um, I guess one of the first things I wanted to ask you with the Pelicans, having lost a few games in a row, 
as a former player, I mean, how did you approach when a team is struggling like this or a team is on mm-hmm. a losing streak? Um, Joe and I, I think, would be the kind of players that would, you know, yeah. overturn tables, maybe slam down some Gatorade. Openly get drunk, get a tattoo in front of everyone to show <laughs> how manly I am. But I'm not, a, I'm not an athlete. I don't know. So, <laughs> so how do you... Okay, those, those, those are all bad approaches. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so thanks for talking us down. That's why you're here, uh, man, my, because, because Jim and I, I don't yeah. know if you can tell by looking at us, uh, we haven't been in the league. <laughs> yeah, haven't, haven't, been, haven't been in the gym lately, huh? No. no, no uh, that my, my approach tended to be more individual. What do I have to do to do my job better? And then collectively, how do we do our jobs better together? And then it's accountability. You heard Coach Willie Green talk about it's his job to be better at holding these guys accountable. What I've noticed and loved about this team is this kind of kumbaya, everybody love everybody, everybody getting along, but it also gets to the point where can I say what I need to say to you the way I need to say it and you take it the right way? Yeah. And as a coach – leading this everybody love everybody and you know we're getting through this together being friends and being nice makes it hard to lead because you don't want to hurt feelings you don't want to sure. rub anybody the wrong way but in this in this game and in sports you got to be able to check your guy they call it not calling out but calling up i call it saying it how how it needs to be said I need you to know you are not getting the job done. There is no reason why this team played so well last year, finishing the season, adding CJ and, and, and Nance, and basically making their way into the playoffs. And now all of a sudden, the things that they did so well, they're not doing. Rebounding, points in the paint. Uh, yes, they had a great November, December and then Zion gets hurt, but Zion didn't play last year. So this is the team we had finishing the season, which says to me then, all right, well, let's get back to doing the things that we do. Shooting's falling off, assists are falling off, points in the paint, rebounding. And, and there's one more thing that I didn't see in this team last year that I'm seeing this year. It's what Jeff Van Gundy used to call letting go of the rope. Yeah. Every game that – the, the Pelicans were down last year. You knew they were going to fight, fight, fight. They won some. They made some close calls. This year, it doesn't seem like they're doing a lot of that anymore. And a lot of those games just start getting away. Instead of 20 points, turns into 30. That bench mob coming off with that energy and that change of pace hasn't been there. So this team really needs to get back to their identity of being those scrappy – Guys that fly around, get deflections, get steals, get out in transition, play with pace, and they're not doing that. David, when you talk about how, as a player, you always took an individual approach as far as kind of looking inward and maybe looking in the mirror and trying to figure out what you can do, um, is mm-hmm. part of that, I mean, not not to name names, but I mean, were there times where you had guys who would act differently if the team's losing, you know, it seems like it would come off as not very genuine if, like, you were laid, a player was laid back all season, and all of a sudden, when you lose games, all of a sudden, he wants to be a leader or he wants to, you know, call people out. I mean, is that part of it too? Is that you just kind of have to keep a consistent approach because it won't be believable if all of a sudden you change your philosophy and start, you know, overturning it's, people's stuff in the locker room? It's it's human nature, right? Um, if you see a guy who just in your job that he doesn't do a whole lot, doesn't say a whole lot, he does his job pretty average. And then all of a sudden he gets a raise or a call into the boss. And then he comes out whooping. Mm -hmm. You're going to look at him like, who is this guy? Right. He hasn't said three words all year. Mm -hmm. Same thing in basketball. I mean, you got to be true to yourself. You got to be true to who you are. And, and that's going to be the hardest change. For me, in my opinion, Coach Willie Green, if you've been nice, 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 and now all of a sudden you're barking, it's a little bit tough. As sure. parents, it's always said you can be tough and ease up. You can't be a pushover, and then all of a sudden 
try to demand respect. So, and I, I'm not saying that the players don't respect coach and, and, and all those things, but the message is going to come across different moving forward. And it may come across a little sharp, a little, a little frustration behind it. And that's where you got to know the people around you. Hey, he's been with us. He's in this. He's in this with us. We're not going to start turning and pointing fingers, which I heard Coach Willie Green say, no one is doing. Everybody's taking responsibility, but it has to go from practice to the court, film room to the court, and somewhere that that transition is not happening the way it should be. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be an interesting stretch here to, to see how Coach Green sort of adjusts his approach to the players because, as you said, it, it has been very friendly. And I think we've we've yes. uh, you know we've loved that camaraderie, and it's gotten us through some dark times. Mm -hmm. But you almost need that mm -hmm. JJ Redick in the locker room sort of voice right now. I, you know, it's it's almost like the team is too young; they're too close. And yes. and one of the new voices in that locker room, one of the few new voices in that locker room, is Josh Richardson, and uh, and he's mm -hmm. now in the starting lineup. It's it's switched things up a bit. And and I think a lot of people, when when Josh Richardson was brought here, myself included, were like, okay, it's nice, brings a little defense, a little size, that's that's great. But his veteran savvy has made him an integral part of this team in a way that I don't think anyone, at least myself, foresaw when he got here. Do you think his voice might help? I mean, how much do you think any new voices, any new perspective might help as this stretch is, hey, you got to fix it in game. No more like, hey, we got the next one. We need to fix it now. Well, I will say this. It, one, it's it's hard to come in as the new guy, you know, barking at people, right? right? But also, when you play to that level consistently every night, you're going out there, you're diving for loose balls, you're giving it up, you're fighting, you're you're in the mix, and you're doing your job. Yes, you can then you know start chirping, start saying the things that need to be said, start looking at other guys and saying, "Hey, man." Listen, we got to be here. It, the one thing I remember when, when I was on some bad teams is coach coming in saying, I'm tired of you pointing at your chest talking about my bad. Hey, let's do a little less my bad and get our jobs done. And that's where this team is. Like, yeah, we see it's your bad. You're the only one that was there. We know it's your, it, we know it's your rotation. We know it's your turnover. And, and those are the kind of things that, that grow in teams. And if you don't nip them in the bud, you, you find yourself in big trouble. You start pointing fingers and you start fraying, and that could be dangerous. Mm -hmm. A couple of specific things on the court that I wanted to ask you about, especially with your perspective as a guy who played in the NBA for a long time. Um, one of the things that we talked about post-game Saturday while you guys were talking on TV, we were doing the post-game radio show, and Gus Kengel asked me, you know, what's the, what should the approach be to the three point shooting where, you know, the team overall isn't shooting well, there's several guys individually who are struggling. I mean, how do you look at that? I mean, do you, do you say we got to keep taking them because that's what's required of the NBA right now? Do we have to adjust and maybe take less because guys aren't making them? I mean, how do you see that specifically to the Pelicans and the way they've been shooting threes lately? Well, you know, and that's, that's, that's where I get lost. You know, this, this whole three-point emphasis, while obviously it's the way the game is and the way the game is played, um, but, you know, stuck in my head is my old-school mentality. If it's not going in, find another way. Get to the free throw line. Get to the – get a layup. Get, you know, get, get fouls. Those kind of things. Whereas, you know, in the past and over the past 11 years I've been doing this, I've been around offensive – for lack of a better word, coordinators talking about we need more threes and the team is shooting in the low thirties from three. And I'm saying, well, why would we keep shooting more threes? Shouldn't we take less threes and have more of an inside game? So, um, you know, obviously these guys are working on it. Obviously these guys are, are, are taking tons of shots and, and, but I'm not seeing that confidence. You know, this team, when it was in first place, second place, third place, wherever, this team was confident. There was a swagger, and none of that is there. And how do you get that back? Well, you get it back by doing your job, playing better brand of basketball, playing together, sharing the ball, and then maybe those three start going in because there's a feel-good around the team as opposed to, you know, 
you know, going out there shooting six four thirty five, and you come in the locker room and coach is saying, "Hey, we need more threes." It, to me, that doesn't that doesn't jive completely. I get it, but uh, this team has to shoot better. And, and this is the thing that was so great about this team early in the season is the shots were going in. Now they're not. So now it puts more onus on defense. And a lot of times when your shots not going, it affects your defense. One of the things that we've heard you always hear in the NBA is that role players, kind of the guys that aren't the star, star players play better at home than they do on the road. And I think there's actually a lot of teams in the NBA this year that have pretty drastic splits between home and road performance, including the Pelicans who are um, 20 and 10 at home, 10 and 21 on the road. I did some David Wesley career research this morning. Oh, and one of the things Uh-oh. that I thought was interesting Uh-oh. was <laughs> you actually were not that kind of player that had like a, at least over the course of your career. I don't know if you had like specific seasons where you, sh- you remember shooting better at home on the road, but if you look at the totality of your career, you actually shot 39% on threes on the road and 35% at home. So you were actually better on the road. You were slightly they better. That dog in them. Free, <laughs> free, slightly better free throw <laughs> shooter on the road. Um, what's the, w- I mean, what advice is there, if, if any, of to try to get, you know, some of the guys to not fluctuate so much? There's several players who have, you know, significant differences if you just look at across the board at their percentages this season, home versus away. That, that's always been a weird thing uh, for me. I, I liked playing on the road. I, I enjoyed the, the the fans that you know were against you and, and booing you and talking trash. Uh, and even though I wasn't a trash talker, I, I enjoyed that kind of yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a stick it to you. Um, I played on a, a Houston Rockets team where, as a team statistic, we were better on the road, which was weird. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't, I don't really know how that difference is. I, I'm assuming you either like it or don't, uh, you either like, I mean, certain gyms I loved, um, you know, when I was in Boston going to play in Charlotte, for some reason it fit my eye. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I can't really speak to why teams, uh, or why players, especially role players, don't necessarily play well other than the momentum and the cheering of the crowd and the the familiarity of the arena that they always play in. Um, And we didn't practice in our arena. So a lot of times we practiced over at our practice site and then, you know, game day, we were, we were in our arena. So maybe that has something to do with it. I don't really know. Um, But somehow this team has to, to fix, individuals first and then as a collective then start holding each other accountable and making and making the right plays you know last mm-hmm. night or the other night they had seven turnovers yeah you're still not supposed to lose a game by 30 no if you have seven turnovers you're supposed to be close and in it but if you shoot the ball poorly and you lose all the stats that have been good to you that's problematic you know, one quick thing I thought of while you were talking about your experience as a player, too, is it po- and only you could answer this, this among us. I mean, is it possible that over the course of your career, you get more and more familiar with these road arenas so they feel more comfortable? I mean, I say that partly because the Pelicans have a bunch of guys that are rookie, second year, third year that haven't played in some of these places very often. Whereas by the time you get to 10, 12 years into your career, you feel like I've played in this gym a million times. It's nothing new. I mean, is there some adjustment that you it might even be subconscious that you just get more comfortable the longer you've been in the league in some of these places and some of these arenas well i i i think that's a very good point i mean first second third year guy the you know especially when they go to the eastern conference you know in three years you see that place three times so it's not a big sample size whereas you know by the time you're in your ninth tenth year you've seen it nine or ten times um, and if you switch conferences, you see it even more, um, and being familiar with arenas, where you're going, where you're staying, all those things mm-hmm. I think subconsciously matter. Uh, you know, you know where you're going. This is not a new situation. It's not like, um, like, you know, Christmas day wonderment. Like, oh, wow. New city, new thing. Now you're about business. Madison square garden. I mean, to go there for the first time, 
it's mind blowing. It's mm-hmm. it's the it's that arena. You know, you're just like, man, I'm here where great people of all walks of life have been through this place. This is really really cool, and yeah. that could uh, you know mess with your mental just a little bit. Get too hyped. Get too whatever. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I I, I it just I don't I don't know what the difference is in the way I played on the road versus you know most role players. Um, so I don't I don't know if sure. I can really put that into exact words of why yeah. guys don't play as well on the road. And I think if you did have the ultimate solution there, you could make a lot of money off yeah, make of that. a phone call, man. Yeah, Please. that would be. So yeah, that would yeah. be a nice consulting job, huh? <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. I, I mean, road expert. I, that, that's that's the thing is yeah. it's hard to say like what you're talking about is as I I wasn't aware that your entire team had positive stats on the road which is interesting and that's that's what it, that's what the big thing is unfortunately I don't know is where you end up a lot and where Jim and I end up a lot is like I don't know I don't know because is it a team yeah. mentality thing is that team mentality and the and the lack of uh, adjustment on the road is it based on youth because the whole team is young. It's it's just hard to say, yeah. but it's a definitive difference, and it, and it's a thing where Jim and I were talking about looking at the upcoming schedule. If you'd have won that game in New York, I was looking at the upcoming schedule mm-hmm. like you know I'm not afraid of any of these teams, none of them, and now right. nothing right. means anything on paper, and I can't say anything on the schedule looks like a juicy matchup. Nothing, not even tonight against the Magic, who have honestly bullied us uh, in in the past. Yeah. So so I hope the team is looking at this game at home, off the road, as this is a must-win, this is at home, there are zero excuses, man. It is the biggest scratch head-scratcher of why this team has gone so far up and so far the other way. Um, and this is basically the same team as the team that finished. And, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know, and I think tonight is a must-win. I don't know why people would ever think, "Oh, well, you don't have to win tonight." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Psychologically, mentally, all those things. Yes, you have to win. This is now. This is now. You can't keep talking about this as a marathon. This is a sprint. This is get as many games in as you can, and and you got to be winning. You can't just be out there going through the motions. Um, that sense of urgency that this team has seemed to show. Um, so often is missing. Um, why is that? You know, and as y'all say, uh, as you just alluded to, the fact that, yeah, that it always comes back to, I don't know. I don't know what's going on because there are certain things and characteristics about this team that, that aren't showing up for 48 minutes. Yeah. yeah, a quarter here, 20 minutes here, but not a complete game of that intense sense of urgency Everybody locked in doing their jobs. Yeah. Well, look, we got to hope for better luck tonight, a better sense of urgency. I've got my fingers crossed. I got my toes crossed. I got things crossed I can't talk about. Uh, David Wesley, right. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I am going to be rooting for the Pelicans louder than I have probably ever, and, and then I can professionally at my job. Uh, I look forward to seeing your coverage. And, uh, and man, let's, let's just hope next time we're not doing an autopsy. When we're talking about the Pelicans, I want a home stretch. That is a, that is a fun one and, and definitely brought the fun today. Thanks for joining us, man. Huge thanks to David Wesley. Sage advice from the old savvy vet. Uh, so, Jim, I guess if we're, uh, if we're in a locker room, uh, don't start smashing ourselves in the head with bottles, uh, you know, yelling at people kicking their personal belongings mm-hmm. apparently not the way to go noted don't point fingers if you do point a finger point it back at yourself that seems to be yeah. david wesley's kind of see i'd be the type theory. to point a finger with one of those big foam i'm number one fingers so it's extra large uh but again i i do things with comical effect that's just uh, apparently not the way to go uh david wesley guiding us through a little bit of this anger i feel slightly better maybe a little more hopeful i don't know how much of that was david wesley i don't know how much of that was time uh between the actual loss and speaking now because i gotta tell you jim if we'd had a podcast that night it would have just been me screaming in another room (laughs) while you gave stats um and so tonight it would have been entertaining it would have been at least avant-garde yes Uh, yes and, and look i don't want it to be morbid monday 
uh, because I want things to turn around more than you know. Uh, so tonight, against the magic, you gotta hope we turn it around, and then, you know, the schedule as as it was before, you know, like, before we were looking at the schedule, and I was like, ah, if you beat the Knicks, you're looking at the magic, you're looking at the Trailblazers, Warriors without Steph Curry, uh, the Kings, hey, the Mavericks are falling apart, I'm not scared of them, I was feeling real high on the horse, boy, do I feel like a real doofus now, I'm like, just the, just the town doofus getting kicked in the head by a mule saying that statement, because... I don't feel good about any of these matchups now. None of them. Well, Joe, I'll say this. I mean, regardless of your feelings, negative, positive, about the next stretch, I do think that these next four games are extremely important, and I'll tell you why. Please. So you have Orlando tonight, the rare home game. They only have one home game between February 11th and March 7th, which is yeah. not great. But, I mean, it's, it's crucial that they get this win. But I think over tonight and the three games on the road trip that you listed – it's crucial that the Pelicans get, I think, at least split those because they can actually put themselves in a position where after this stretch of four games, I feel like on paper at least things do look a lot better and specifically because after this road trip out west, you have a four-game home stand against Dallas, OKC, Portland, and the Lakers. Those last three games on that home stand are the, happen to be – coincidentally the three teams that are in 11th 12th and 13th place not exactly in that order but in a combination of that the pelicans are 10th right now hoping so hoping they can move right up now. Yeah. so you have a you have a very direct chance to put yourself at least in a little bit better comfortable position as far as definitely in the play in tournament not have to sweat it out the last week of the season what have you and then after that four game homestand where you have those those especially those three important matchups and there, there's Dallas actually also starts that homestand. But after that, you're playing four straight games against what I would term to be bottom tier opponents in the league. And the reason why at the all-star break, the Pelicans had quote unquote, the easiest schedule in the NBA remaining or one of them. Um, that stretch after the homestand is two road games at Houston consecutively on a weekend. And then they play the Spurs and the Hornets. Now, the way the Pelicans are playing right now, would I go into any game saying, ah, this is a gimme. They, can got, they got this in the back. Right. No. Yeah, those but, days are over for me. But, but what I'm saying is, just to kind of emphasize, this next week or so of these four games, I do think that as long as they can get a couple wins, I mean, we want them to win as many games as possible. All of them would be great. All of them would be neato. But if they can at least kind of keep the ship afloat a little bit here over this next stretch – the schedule, to me, does turn in their favor. And as gloomy as it's been lately and some of the stuff that we've talked about, I mean, like I said earlier when we were talking to David, they're 20 and 10 at home. So I do still have some confidence that when they come home that they'll play better. And, I mean, there's very tangible specific reasons for that, including various players have played a ton better here than they have on the road. Um, Trey Murphy, I think, is has pretty significant splits shooting-wise. He's been much better here. Um, Jose Alvarado, you could go down the list. So, yeah. I mean, Portland is a good example. They play them two more times in Portland. They play them once here. Would I go into the game here with more confidence that they can beat them? Yes, definitely, mm-hmm. based on the the entire track record of the season. So get through this next week or so, pick up a couple wins, and I think we'll be in a lot better mood when we come back for that four-game homer. That's what I like to hear, Jimothy, a little optimism, because here's the thing. I've been sitting over here anytime I get a chance, whether it be radio, whether it be on this podcast, whether it be just someone mentioning them at the bank, uh, someone just says the Lakers, and I go, ah, <laughs> clown show. I've been goofing on the Lakers for so long, feeling so good about myself. And, you know, now they actually look uh, dangerous. Now mm. they're nipping at our heels. Yep. And, uh, boy, would it be just an extra black eye for us to end up in the lottery and the Lakers end up in the playoffs. Uh, and I don't want to be that wrong. See, I, just I can't be. I try to turn things positive and, and have a little I sunshine. Know. I know. And you had to bring up the Lakers. But no, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, there's no denying it. The way that they've played lately and since they've made the trade, they had a miracle comeback of they were down by 27 points and beat the Mavericks. So the only, I guess, to try to still say stay a sunshine gym, I mean, the positive of that is that Dallas is only one and a half games ahead of the Pelicans. And Dallas mm-hmm. is in sixth place. So it's funny. I heard people talking about this in relation to the Lakers and a few other teams, but it also applies to the Pelicans, even though um, we need to get some wins before we can really go down this road. But yes. they're not. there's a bunch of teams that aren't that far out of the top six, which if you finish six, you don't even go in the playing tournament. So, I mean, 
the game coming up against the Mavericks head to head could end up being one that we look at as huge. But um, the standings again, it, it's unbelievable how keep they keep getting more and more compact. Yeah, no, so. I mean, look, here's the thing. It, it, I'm going to turn it into the deer hunter here. You see this very shiny, colorful gun I'm going to spin around here. It's the sunshine gun. Uh, it is, uh, it is for optimism only <laughs> Oh boy! and it is, uh, it is, I'm going to put it to you right now. Real expectations, real. If you had to be forced now to pass a lie detector test, where do you realistically think the Pelicans will land right now? Man, put me on the spot. Sunshine I think, guns point. <laughs> I think right now that they are going to be in the play in tournament and it's a matter of, can they finish seven or eight so that they have two chances to win one game. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's realistic. I mean, even though they're 10th right now, they win tonight. They'll be, I believe ahead of Minnesota, they'll be back up to ninth. I mean, this is very fluid. You win a couple games and you can jump a couple spots, but yeah, um, I, I don't want people to laugh at me and have me sit here and say like, yeah, they're going to be top six. No problem. They got it. Yeah. So I, I think right now, I think that they're, um, they should be targeting getting into the playing tournament that that's, not a guarantee right now, and that's obvious from looking at the standings at how close specifically Portland and the Lakers are. And OKC is not that far back either; they're about mm-hmm. a game and a half or two be- behind. So um, that's what I'm looking at. If, if you if you point the gun at me and say make a prediction, darn it, yep. I would say that they're going to be a play-in tournament team. And right now, I mean, even unfortunately, like eight or nine would yeah. be would be optimal compared to where they are. Well, I'm gonna take this and point it at myself here. Uh, by the way, if you, if you pull the trigger, it just goes bang and roses come out. Uh, so I'm going to put the gun up to myself here and say, I still believe they get six, Jim. I am going to be that guy that can get <laughs> wow. laughed at. I what a do turn. What a turn of events. I am not going to live afraid. Uh, mm. I still have optimism. You bring Zion back, and you now have Dyson Daniels back available. I understand the Larry Nance news hurts, but this might be the shakeup and the absolute rock bottom that the Pelicans need to turn around. Uh, I believe that Willie Green feels the pressure that is legitimately mounting. Uh, I actually think that the Pelicans can and will uh, turn it around. When I look at the standings uh, in front of me, I just, I still, in my heart, I don't know if it's just pure hate, but I still don't think the Lakers can catch us. Uh, the the Trailblazers, uh, Dame is great. I still feel like we are a better constructed team than the Trailblazers. I still like we're a be- feel like we're a better constructed team than the Timberwolves, than the Jazz. The Mavericks are falling apart. Uh, I just, look, I'm just saying, when you look at these teams and I look at the core collection of Pelicans that are going to be truly making the push, I feel pretty good. You know the beauty of what you just went through? The, the I was keeping track in my head, the list of teams that you mentioned. The beauty of this is other than Utah, the Pelicans play every single one of those teams that you just listed. So they will get a chance to prove the Cardosi theory and mm-hmm. the optimism and the belief that he has in them directly by playing these teams. And it's going to be a matter of at the end of the night, if the scoreboard is in your favor, mm-hmm. Joe has been – uh, validated. Otherwise, you're going to have to come back here and apologize. Yeah, that's fine. Look, it roast me on Twitter. It means you're actually following me. Hey, I'm up to like 253 now, by the way. Uh, and look, if I'm wrong, then I will turn this sunshine gun into a harpoon. Uh, so who cares? We will find out one way or the other. But look, I think it turns around tonight and we will be in that number. Jim will be in the studio with us. Hanging around, if nothing else. Gus Kattengell and I will be on the air half an hour before tip. Uh, Big thanks to David Wesley for joining us, talking us off the proverbial ledge. And, uh, you know, I I think we we had a gradient. It was a little bit of a roller coaster, but I feel like we are rising back up, hopefully, as will your mood, Pelicans fans. Uh, We are the Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek. Big thanks to Jim Eichenhofer. Big thanks to you for listening. We will talk to you once again on Wednesday. And until then, you know what? I'm going to turn it over to uh, our friend David Wesley here. Let's go, pal. Let's go, pal. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek. Join us three times per week on pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, or you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. 
We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast presented by SeatGeek.